So good morning. Welcome to Wellness in the Woods and our second annual wellness conference. Um, we have some really important people to recognize here today. Um, I'm Jody Freiholtz London. I'm the founder and executive director of Wellness in the Woods. And we started Wellness in the Woods in March of 2013 in response to the need for a mental health consumer organization that really focused on out-of-state Minnesota. Because our, our needs are unique and because I'm a pretty strong advocate and you can either say mouthy or a strong advocate, and I'm going to go with that. Okay. Um, we have, um, besides myself, Kim is back doing video, and she has just been promoted from our board chair to being our communication specialist. She has a background in graphic arts and videography, and wow, and she was our pickup person for grapes and snacks and orange juice at McDonald's and potatoes and possibly everything else that I sent her text messages to do for me, so thank you very much, Kim. We have some board members here also today. Um, we need a black hawk who may still be out front. There she is, Winita, can you wave? She's our new board chair. Uh, Jean Schuster is right in back. Um, Beth Kern. All right, Beth Kern, thank you very much. Um, Fonda Knudsen is on her way. Terry Brown was not able to be here today. Vernon D. Jensen was not able to be here. And we're, we're trying to gather in a couple more suspects that we think are going to be on our board. Mim Moss has kind of sort of said that she would be willing to. Could you wave your hand, Mim? Hiya, hiya, we can't see you. <laughs> And we're working on Brad back over there, so he hasn't actually said he would, but um, he's, he's had a lot of, oh, that's a beautiful princess wave, I love it, thank you. Can you do that elbow, elbow, no. wrist, wrist, flip your hair, a little no. kiss? No, not a, not a bit like that. All right, wonderful. So, thank you for being here this morning. We are hoping that you will not only have a lot of fun, but to do some great learning and that every year that we get together, that we can meet with friends and support people. Um, I really want to thank you for blessing me. We have been working on bringing this together for a whole year since last year. And this is really what my passion in my life is about, is supporting other people. And in return, I get supported and blessed. And I cannot begin to tell you the absolute wonderful people that I have met. Um, some just for a little bit, but we have some new relationships that are building with Wellness in the Woods that I am very excited about. Some of them are people who are going to be speaking here today. Um, I am really excited uh, to meet Deanna schlichting Schlichting-Sternagel this afternoon who created Jake's Hope in memory of her son that she lost due to suicide. And we're going to be doing some, some more work with some of the folks who are, who are working in that area. So. Some of the people who are coming today I've never met before, and some of you I certainly consider my friends and family. So with that, um, we have David Harper, who is going to come and talk to us about the history of behavioral health in Minnesota. And I'll let you tell them a little bit more about yourself. And when I met David, he was the assistant commissioner, and he's now moved into bigger and better things, would you say? <laughs> OK, thank you. Good as it gets. I uh, attended uh, my youngest son's uh, was in a football game last night, and it's about you know this is my absolute favorite time of year. Um, I'm very glad to be here. I was thrilled when nobody asked me. I, I don't remember exactly when it was that uh, you asked me to come up here because most of the time when I talk, it's really from a professional standpoint, uh, and I'm representing a healthcare system or. Uh, statewide policy or something like that, but the opportunity to talk about personal recovery and, and kind of tie things in together for me um, because a lot of the conversation I have today really pulls together uh, my professional life, but also personal life. And, and how does that tie in uh, to my recovery, to the recovery of, the, uh, of everyone's personal recovery? 
Okay, where we came from. Um, Bethlehem Royal Hospital, 1427 that was founded. And the way it was done, that's a hospital uh, referred to as Bedlam. And what did Bedlam come to mean over time is that absolute chaos. If you can imagine what the warehousing of people that uh, are uh, psychotic, delusional, all just warehoused together in large facilities and uh, the, uh, what the nature of that kind of experience would be. And that's really um, what we had for, you know, hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years. That, that's, what, that's what occurred to people struggling with mental illness. Um, and then the concept kind of moved along to a concept called asylum. And people started to create asylums because that was a much better concept where it was, it's, it's like if you go away to, an, uh, if you seek asylum in another country, the idea is that you have a place that's safe. It will keep you safe and supply what you need and you can get away from the hazards of where you are. And that was kind of the concept. I mean, it was a, I think it was a very well-meaning concept. Um, the problem with the concept was didn't play out very well. It, I, I think it helped support a lot of denial from the general population as to what was actually going on. I've got a couple pictures. These are inside Fergus Falls. So you can kind of see this was circa 1900, what the care looked like. You can kind of see it looks like the nurse is really putting on the show for the cameras here. <laughs> um, but if you imagine individuals with untreated schizophrenia, untreated, you know, uh, bipolar, in these kind of conditions, this is actually from first you know, when it was in its day, imagine that building looking with this kind of population inside, what that must have been like. Um, I think um, that uh, work in the facilities, and she would have been in, I, I believe, in the 40s or 30s. Um, but again, this was considered state-of-the-art, 1937. Well, great. It's been great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Those that have drugs in your pocket, <laughs> marijuana, everything, Mason will be running around in the checking, especially you, ma'am. <laughs> if you have a bomb in your pocket, he'll be checking that too. Okay. Hi, my name's Brad Livingston. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? Doing okay. All right. I. I started that that way on purpose because everybody's misconception, especially with a German Shepherd and a Belgian Malinois, of course he's got to be a bomb dog. Of course he's got to check for marijuana. If you have marijuana, you wouldn't know the difference between that and parsley. <laughs> All right, my name is Brad Livingston. My companion is Mason. Come on. Good boy. All right. Uh, I have PTSD. <laughs> Who knows what that is? Okay. Post traumatic stress disorder. I don't like the D because I'm not disordered. I don't have a disease. I'm not dysfunctional. PTSD is classified as reacting normal to an adverse situation. That's what a dog can do. They wake you up. It's what we call touch. They'll touch you if you need it. To kind of wake you up that second. 
having one automatically attached to you also keeps it in mind all the time. Having him, believe me, I have two kids, is like having two kids on your hip 24-7. Something I know, we have five veterans, Vietnam veterans, believe me, they've seen everything and done everything, and they were basket cases, they lived in the middle of Minnesota, they lived in the trees and didn't go anywhere. Now they're out in public speaking, and doing that. So why not a dog? So let me just kind of give you a little overall of what, um, of how wellness in the woods came to be. Um, I've worked in the mental health field for, some people say since Noah, but I don't think it's been that long, but for a long time, like 30 years. And things that I've done in the mental health field are, I worked in housing support, I was an arms worker, um, adult rehabilitative mental health services, I worked in support and employment for about 15 years, I did, um, I'm a certified peer specialist and a certified peer specialist trainer and I'm soon to go back and get that um, training refreshed so that I can actually start training people in places other than Minneapolis St. Paul where not everybody wants to go for training. Um, I am a facilitator and advanced level facilitator for RAP, the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And last week, with a partnership with NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, we, um, Teresa, one of the gals who was in the kitchen, and I both completed the mental health first aid training. So we are going to be able to travel around Minnesota and help communities, no matter where they are and who they are, understand the basics of what uh, mental and emotional illnesses are and how they can support someone. First of all, who knows or has heard of the Olmstead plan is? Ooh. Okay, that's why we're going to talk about Olmsted. Any <laughs> <laughs> place on here you said, Charlie? Yep. Other button. Huh? Other button? <laughs> Technology is not my high point. That's why thank you, Charlie Olson from Edge Technology, has been here helping us all day set things up. <laughs> Um, Charlie has served on the Children's Mental Health Advisory Council and also serves as an advisor to the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. He's been very involved in, in mental health for a long, long time. And all of us who work as staff and board members identify as having a mental health diagnosis. So we can kind of say that we have the t-shirt. But that's why we want you to know why Olmstead is so important and where it came from. So, the story of Olmsted itself began with two women. The name were Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson. They had a mental illness and developmental disabilities. They were voluntarily admitted to the psychiatric unit in Georgia, in a regional hospital, and following their medical treatment, the mental health professional stated that each was ready to move to a community-based program. However, even though everybody agreed that it was time for them to move on, they remained confined in that institution for years. Years. After the initial treatment was concluded, they filed suit under the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, for release from that hospital. In June of 1999, the United States Supreme Court held that in Olmstead versus LC, unjustified segregation of people with disabilities constitutes discrimination in violation of the Title II of the American with Disabilities Act. The court held that public entities must provide community-based services to people with disabilities when services are appropriate, when the affected persons do not oppose those treatments, and when community-based services can be reasonably accommodated, taking into account the resources available to the public entity and the needs of others who are receiving disability services from the entity. 
And I did get a PowerPoint, but it was from a lawyer, and believe me, you didn't want to see it. So we had to, we had to I don't want to say dumb it down. I just don't talk legally, so I wanted to make it so I understood it. The other thing that happened is the Supreme Court explained that in its holding, is reflecting two evident judgments. First, institutional placement of people who can handle and benefit from living in the community perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that persons so that are isolated like that are incapable and unworthy of participating in community life. Didn't we used to think that being in the hospital was because we were sick, not because we were unworthy? I mean, this is just common sense, right? When I first read Olmstead, I just, I looked at the ombudsman who was telling me about it, and I'm like, this just seems like respecting each other. Do we have to have a law to be nice and respect each other? Obviously we do. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Deanna Sternando. I'm one of the founders of Jake's Hope. I'm not a professional. I'm just a mother with first-hand experience, and I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't get involved until it happened to me. It's awesome to see you all here. The stigma behind discussing mental health issues and suicide are devastating considering the numbers, and those numbers are rising. I ask everyone here, to please acknowledge the connection between mental health issues, bullying, addictions, suicide is preventable, and everyone needs to get involved. It's everyone's business. And I'm going to introduce Carrie Crummel, who is a Jake's Hope board member and also QPR trained certified instructor. Thank you, Deanna, for sharing the story about Jake. Um, we have, uh, since Jake's passing, we've formed an organization called Jake's Hope um, in order to offer hope to other families um, and also, as Deanna had said, to advocate and um, help do some suicide prevention within our communities. So what we're going to go through now is called the QPR training. And what it is, it's really training, it's called the gatekeeper training for the average person and how you can spot somebody who may be experiencing this. You can spot some signs and signals of somebody who could be going through a suicidal crisis and what to do to get them help. Uh, there's a myth that no one can stop a suicide, that it's inevitable. But in fact, uh, we believe that anybody can stop a suicide provincially per to prevent that, to get them some support, to get them some help. It's really anybody's job. 